When it comes to writings from the 20th century historians and archaeologists, they say the crossbow was introduced to Africa, um, at least Sub-Saharan Africa, by the Portuguese from the 14th and the 15th century. As a person from the 21st century, I try to give a less biased perspective, and in my opinion, there's no reason to assume they can't come up with this trigger on their own, um, and it had to be influenced by the Europeans. Um, it's difficult to say today, um, with the amount of uh, evidence we really have. And these are all theories, I think, for modern historians to be de debating on. When it comes to East Africa and South Af Africa, we have almost no evidence of um, crossbows. So most of the crossbows in Africa are from West Africa and Central Africa. The Yoruba people, for example, they prefer the longbow compared to the crossbow, and they don't really view these as effective weapons. So their crossbows were much smaller, probably because they relied on melee weapons or, um, you know, javelins or other kind of missile weapons, or the bow, instead of, of the crossbow. So perhaps it was just a very short crossbow for hunting, or just for one shot, and then you run with your spear and you engage in a melee. Um, so that's with the Yoruba style crossbows, but then with the um, Bafang tribes, it seems they relied on these a lot more. But for hunting purposes, this would actually be very good because um, most of the time you're hunting small game. And I want to talk about the ammunition they use. Um, this is a Southeast Asian quiver with arrows, but I don't have an African quiver with African arrows to show you, but the dimensions are similar and that's why I brought it. They have a poison at the tips. And that is their secret weapon. Portuguese and Spanish explorers, they really fear these things because you, you can't even see it um, in the jungles of West Africa. One of the things they mentioned is because these are so light, wind can easily blow it away. So they usually have a small roof right here to prevent that from falling. And they sometimes actually put gum right here. So it kind of sticks so that the wind doesn't blow it away. That shows you how light these corals were. Um, and when it comes to the draw weight and the power stroke, let's talk about that. Um, compared to a bow, this is an extremely low amount of power stroke of about three inches, roughly. Um, that kind of power stroke is incredibly low compared to a bow. Um, but then if you look at the dimensions of the bow, to pull this from here to here, you're looking at least 100 pounds of draw weight. And if you look at some of the, some of the um, drawings, and it shows them actually sitting on their butt, pulling it, which would be at least 100 pounds, perhaps 200 pounds of a draw weight. You're not going to damage the bow when your power stroke is only this low. So yes, you might be shooting 200 pounds with a maybe 10 grain arrow, uh, but it's not going to damage the bow. In fact, it can be dry fired with such a short power stroke. Uh, it will wear out the string, but it, it should be fine considering how low the power stroke is, and that's why they can shoot these very light corals. Another thing you'll notice is the string is have, has almost no tension. This is actually naturally deflexed, and there's a good reason for that. Um, you don't want to be unstringing and stringing a bow all the time, especially if you're hunting alone. It's quite difficult to string this by yourself. Um, with two people, it's a lot easier if it was a straight a bow and then you just strung it. But if you're by yourself hunting um, and then the string breaks and you want to put a second string and well with 200 pounds of draw weight it's very difficult for one man to string this um, and it would take time to string. But with a deflex design after the string breaks just put another string. And again you're shooting very light corals so the efficiency doesn't matter. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Um, so it's very inefficient in that design but at the same time the purpose of them is is to deliver poison, not to cause, not for, like the kinetic energy isn't that important. As long as it penetrates flesh to deliver the poison, the job is done, right? So when it comes to the deflex bows, they're usually heat bent or steam bent, just on a cooking pot, you can easily steam bend this um, to get that natural deflex shape, or perhaps they just use a nat natural uh, stave that's already deflex. And um, a reflex horn bow like this, um, you can't leave it strong forever. Um, when it comes to securing the prod, it's usually a slot and then they have these wedges attached at the front for the Western African design. They vary in design depending on the culture, but typically it's a slot and you put it in. If you compare with a European design um, brought by the conquistadors, 
um, they're most likely using steel crossbows with um, bow irons or at least hemp lashing. When it comes to the wood, I'm not familiar with African woods, so I can't really tell you what kind of hardwoods these are, but of course they're made of local African hardwoods. It's a very heavy crossbow and very dense, um, not softwood for sure. Um, perhaps some of the components are made softwood, such as the wedges, but I doubt it. Um, and then let's talk about the trigger mechanism. So this is a split stock design and it's an antique, so it's kind of jammed in. It's hard to like actually open the trigger, but yeah, the, the trigger is very jammed. I wouldn't even try to, oh, there you go. I opened it. So this is how the trigger works. You open the stock, which is a split stock. Um, and then now you, you put the string onto the groove and then you push the pin by uh, closing the lever and that will push the string up. And it, it does make sense that they wouldn't use a roller nut trigger because they don't need any of that. They're using poison as the main weapon, not the momentum of the bolt, not the, not the weight, the size, the velocity of the bolt. Those are not that important. The poison is. So really, you just need something that delivers the poison. It's a very long stock, but, and people might wonder why is it so long for these fang tribes. I think the primary reason why it's so long is her balance. Again, these were primarily used as hunting tools, so you want something to have a nice balance and control. And if it's too front heavy, you're gonna be less accurate um, and you can hold it less long. But by, by having this, you have a lot more leverage so you can hold it longer and waiting to ambush that monkey or bird you're, you're aiming for. So you can hold it long. This is a pretty heavy crossbow and I'm already tired hold, holding this. Um, um, but just imagine if all the weight was in the front, it would be even hard, you know, uh, more tiring to hold it for a long time uh, for ambushing animals. Um, so keep that in mind. Another possibility is that, um, I'm not too sure about this, but another possibility is you can use this as a walking stick if the split stock was shorter and then you have the stronger uh, piece of wood um, and perhaps they can do it that way. But another reason is this has a lot of draw weight actually, um, for maybe 200 pounds, and you need a long lever to push that. Um, 200 pounds with, you need a lever. You can't just have a tiny little lever here. So this is another reason why you want a long a lever. Um, when it comes to why the stock is split, perhaps that was just done for convenience. It's easy to split this. And then once you split the piece of wood, now you have a lever. And the lever of course will fit perfectly because it's split. So um, perhaps that's why they, they use this design. Um, when it comes to how the lever is attached to the stock, it's just a piece of gum, I think, or some kind of glue that is just attached at the ends. And apparently that is strong enough. Um, and of course the pin itself is the main thing holding it. The gum is just there so it doesn't fall on the front. This is a very simple crossbow and it reminds me, of course, it's a very similar crossbow and it's very similar in design to these Southeast Asian crossbows even though it's so far away. And these are certainly not influenced by Europeans, but it just shows that, you know, um, other cultures can come up with their own trigger designs natively if they, if they want. Um, it doesn't really require influence from other cultures. Well, it is a possibility. I doubt it. Thank you very much for watching. This is Jack from Historical Archery.